What's happening in Israel right now is horrible, and my heart goes out to everyone that is affected by the conflict. But in today's video, I'm not going to pretend to be a geopolitical expert. What I am going to do is run you through how I think the current conflict can affect the crypto market and look at historical examples of how markets have reacted during times of war. So we're going to look at how Bitcoin could perform throughout this period, what's going to happen to altcoins, what the charts are telling us, and of course, also historically, what this typically means for markets, because it does have huge ramifications on things like CPI, and that could affect the Fed's response. And of course, there are many knock-on effects because of that for markets, which could potentially cause certain price action for Bitcoin and alt. So in today's video, we're going to look at that and also how you can position your portfolio to weather the storm, so to speak, if things get worse. And hopefully the context that I provide you can help you navigate these markets better if you're just a little bit confused at the moment, because we have altcoins tanking, we have Bitcoin holding up surprisingly well, and we have many different opinions flying around about the market at the moment, which makes it pretty confusing from an investment standpoint to make decisions. So firstly, I want to go through what's currently happening in terms of the market impact of the conflict. We did see Bitcoin hold up relatively well uh, over the last day or so, although we did have that rejection off the 200 EMA. We have altcoins significantly down. We have a slight pullback across equities. Gold and oil have ticked up slightly as well. What I want to do is look at how the markets could react based on past data of how the market has reacted to past geopolitical and military events. We do have a sample size of events, as you can see in front of you, ranging from Pearl Harbor to the Iraq War. Then after that, we are going to get into the more recent conflict, which was the, you know, the Russia-Ukraine conflict earlier in the year. What I want to say about this data is that the unpredictable and fast changing nature of such events does make it really hard to make short term predictions. We don't know if things are going to escalate. We don't know if things are going to wind down. As I said, I'm not going to give geopolitical opinions in today's video. You have to work that out for yourself. Um, but what we do know is these events are really unpredictable and that makes trading them a really hard task. So in my opinion, the best thing to do is just make sure your portfolio is really built to weather the storm. I'm going to talk about how you can do that in a second. Um, instead of trying to time the market, you know, I don't think you should make rash decisions and like sell a bunch of alts into Bitcoin or sell a bunch of Bitcoin into alts just based on changing macro conditions, because just as they can change for the worse, they can also change for the better. Now in the past, typically what has happened is markets have recovered actually relatively quickly from wars and other geopolitical shocks, despite experiencing initial volatility. So what you can see here is many of these other wars and geopolitical events uh, have begun with major drawdowns. You can see minus three point four, minus three, minus seven, um, etc. And then three months later, they've actually hit their peak in terms of drawdowns. But by the 12 month mark, you can see that the average return across markets is actually 8.6%, which is almost in line of that 10% average that we've seen from equities historically. So pretty much there is no real effect over a longer duration of these events, although you do see volatility blips in the short term. Long term, there isn't a huge impact on markets, which I find super interesting. Now, obviously, the size of the conflict does dictate how quickly the markets recover and the severity of the conflict, how many countries are involved, etc. But I thought this was super interesting data. Now on the crypto side, how does crypto typically respond during conflicts? Well, we can look at the Russia-Ukraine war as one sample size that we have from 2022 to give us a little bit of data as to how crypto and more specifically Bitcoin actually responds. So you can see here on the date that the US said that an invasion of Ukraine could occur at any time, Bitcoin, Ripple, Ether, and Binance, so the biggest currencies at the time, actually responded positively. Um, then they ended up having major declines over the following week. Then they had a small bounce. And then by the end of the month, they'd essentially leveled out to the same price performance as on the day that the US said an invasion could occur. So pretty much, we can't really take much from this data. Crypto performed pretty much negligibly, although it did have a, a bit of volatility and although it did have some downside, by the end of the month, it had pretty much fully recovered. And if we compare Bitcoin to the NASDAQ, the S&P, and also the All Country World Index, although Bitcoin initially outperformed, the performance ended up being very similar to equities. And the fact that this graph was taken from a week prior to the US uh, stating that an invasion could occur, it pretty much skews the data because Bitcoin performed positively heading into the conflict. So there's not much we can take there. Bitcoin essentially performed the same as equities over that period as well. And if you look at Bitcoin versus gold, well, it pretty much paints the same picture. Although US 10 
10 year treasuries uptick slightly, so did gold and so did Bitcoin. Bitcoin actually responded decently during the initial beginning of the conflict, but then it had huge declines uh, in the preceding months. Obviously, April, May, June, July last year were bearish months for Bitcoin, but you got to remember Luna happened during that period and then FTX happened later that year. So the entire macro landscape for Bitcoin wasn't exactly conducive of good price performance. So it's very hard to extrapolate any data from this, but it's just interesting to know um, that despite a lot of headlines coming out around the time, Bitcoin pretty much didn't show any signs of flinching in terms of its price action. But nevertheless, that war, although it did escalate, it didn't end up getting to the point where it was like a full-on world war. And, you know, in the beginning, a lot of people were speculating on that maybe being the case if more countries got involved. And I'm not going to get into my theories on, on the Israel war or anything. Um, but what I do think is prudent to do in these times is really consider how does your portfolio look? I think it's a good reminder that all portfolios should have some sort of hedging mechanism mechanism. They should have some sort of diversification because it's not only geopolitical events that affect markets, but it can be any sort of, you know, major supply shock, major event like we saw in March 2020 due to the pandemic. There are many reasons why your portfolio could experience volatility. And I think it's wise and it's prudent to be planning and preparing for these eventualities. So Bob Elliott did an amazing thread. I want to break down some of the key points from this thread that basically outlines how certain asset classes end up responding during times of uncertainty. So he said, wars by nature are inflationary as goods requiring raw materials are produced and then destroyed without an increase in productivity. They are also a bad time for cash since governments keep financing costs low. Governments typically finance their expenditure by increasing their bond issuance during these periods. In order to keep those financing costs low, bond yields are also kept low. After the initial rise in bonds in response to the conflict, and we actually did see that during the Russia war as well, as I showed you before, bonds dropped nearly 50%. Stocks perform poorly initially during conflicts because companies' priorities shift and there is a significant uncertainty about who will win. In the US's case, stocks were in a drawdown for much of the period until rallying once it became clearer a victory would come. So pretty much you have that initial decline, as I showed you in the graph before, when there's an initial uncertainty around a war. And then what you do see is as certainty comes to light, uh, markets hate uncertainty. As we know, the markets typically recover. And by the 12 month point, the effect on the market is essentially uh, negligible. And that is a point that he is also reiterating here. Of course, the outcome was much worse for the losers in the war, where stocks fell roughly 80% and even worse in real terms. So countries closer to home in this scenario uh, do end up performing worse. Commodities, however, do very well during war periods. And this is the interesting Bitcoin argument. From the time of Pearl Harbor until the end of the war, commodities delivered a 100% plus return. So of course, commodities in a time of mass money printing are considered like inflation hedges to some extent, and you do need commodities to finance conflicts. So commodities, um, that could be silver, that can be gold, that can be also usable commodities like food, but Bitcoin has also started to come to light during this time uh, and conversations around Bitcoin as a digital gold safe haven type asset have also come to the forefront. Now, I think just Bitcoin's price action itself does suggest that it is a lot more immune to these market conditions than other assets. And that's because Bitcoin's kind of in this place where it's not really a safe haven asset yet. But at times, for example, during the banking collapse, it does decide to behave like a safe haven asset. And it's my full belief that eventually Bitcoin gets to a place where it really is a true representation of digital gold. But I think the data we have in front of us due to its heavy correlation to risk assets such as tech stocks does suggest that Bitcoin is still a risk on asset until proven otherwise. And because it does have that safe haven narrative behind it, which is why it performs better than altcoins during these periods, uh, you still have to accept that we aren't fully there yet. But Bitcoin, I wouldn't call it a fully fledged commodity as such. So I wouldn't be speculating on Bitcoin in times of uncertainty. I think that is a mistake. You have to accept that it's correlated and treated like a, a tech stock in most cases. But I would also accept that Bitcoin holds up better than and other assets during this period as well. Uh, and maybe better than some like, you know, really risk on assets like altcoins, etc. In a minute, I'm going to talk about Bitcoin specifically and some of the reasons why I think it's outperforming alts and also what I think is going to happen to alts as well. So make sure you stick around for that uh, because that's really, really important for our portfolios at the moment. So on Thursday this week, we have US CPI data. This is a really important reading as the last two CPI readings have actually upticked, which have shown a slight uptick in inflation and have been the reason why the Fed have continued to keep rates higher for longer. So they've continued on their rate hiking cycle. But we do want to see inflation start 
starting to come down uh, because if inflation starts coming down, then the Fed maybe can relax their stance slightly. The market is expecting, though, that rates don't move, so they don't hike or they don't cut, with an 89% probability of that being the case during the next meeting, which is on November 1st. Then on December 13th, there's a 70% probability of no hike as well, uh, and it's over 50% all the way until March next year. So pretty much market anticipating the Fed does not do much, and we kind of see the effect of the previous rate hikes start to bake into the market. But if there is a material change due to any sort of escalation here in the Israel conflict, then that could definitely uh, start to affect the Fed stance. Because if we do see CPI starting to uptick due to, let's say, a crazy pump in oil prices, then the Fed may have to respond by hiking rates. And I think this is your number one risk uh, when it comes to crypto and the macro side of things. It's oil and commodities going absolutely crazy, and then that, that impacts CPI. And then that has obviously knock-on effects because transportation becomes more expensive, and pretty much that gets better baked into goods and services. You see inflation. What does Fed do to combat inflation? It hikes rates. So I'm not saying this will necessarily be the case because there's nothing to say that this will escalate to the point where it really starts to affect uh, the oil price. There are certain scenarios where, of course, it would. Um, but during Russia, Ukraine, we did see oil significantly uptick. And then we also saw it start to come back down. It did obviously pump in response to the news of the conflict breaking out. And although I'm not panicking yet, it's certainly something to take note of if oil prices continue to Rise, how could that affect inflation? And thus, how could that affect the Fed's response? I don't think it's any reason to make any material portfolio changes, but it is definitely something to note. And you can kind of see here simplified how markets react. Uh, if there is an escalation, rates go up, oil goes up, stocks go down. And of course, crypto, which is a risk on asset as well as stocks also goes down. So this is the probably the scenario you see happening, but altcoins going down more than Bitcoin, of course, because Bitcoin does have an element of, you know, safe haven-esque nature to it, whereas altcoins don't. Uh, but that is with escalation. If things start to alleviate and calm down over the next few weeks, I think you can go back into kind of business as usual mode where the market is a little less jolty and we kind of start focusing back on the macro and also on the crypto specific events, for example, the Bitcoin spot ETF and the halving next year as well. So now's the time where I look at the charts and I talk about Bitcoin and I talk about Ethereum because these are definitely the two leading charts in crypto at the moment. On the Bitcoin side, you can see clearly that we rejected twice off the 200 EMA. Bitcoin showing signs of slowing down every time it heads into that pocket of resistance at 28K. This is pretty much no man's land. The way I would describe Bitcoin right now is it's in the middle of a range. So you've got your range extremity. So that's the lower end of the range right now at 25k you have the upper echelon of the range up here at 30k we, we tested and we ended up being rejected after multiple tests of the 31k level now we're just in the middle so we're actually below the 200 ma which is marking out the mid-range perfectly at the moment and until there's a concrete flip of this level um i don't think we can assert we're necessarily heading up to the top of the range either so what you would want to see on bitcoin is it actually flip and not just deviate above, but hold above. So close above on the daily, the 200 MA, and then start to make that thrust to the upwards uh, bound of the range. That is something you would you want to be looking out for if you're a Bitcoin bull. But of course, we have rejected off this level. Uh, so if Bitcoin starts to make higher lows, then you can kind of start targeting this 25K level again. Because we're in the middle of the range and Bitcoin isn't exhibiting any momentum to either side just quite yet, it's pretty much, I think for most people, a no trade zone. Of course, you can pick off little altcoin scalps here and then. You can DCA into, you know, your favorite coins, Bitcoin ETH long term, of course. Um, we're still pos positioning ourselves for 2024 and 2025. But in terms of like any trades right now, you probably want to target more like extremity based trades. So, you know, shorting when Bitcoin gets here or potentially longing a, a, a substantiated breakout or looking to take a support long at the 25K zone, either end of the spectrum here, I think is better than trying to punt in the middle of the range. That's just how I feel about Bitcoin. But how will altcoins continue to respond? Because altcoins have been hammered over the last week. And look, it's pretty much undeniable that dominance keeps going up and up and up. And the truth of the matter is, A, Bitcoin responds better during times of uncertainty, like we are in at the moment, because it's considered by some to be a digital gold. Um, and B, it's got the much stronger catalyst behind it. It's got the Bitcoin spot ETF. It's got the Bitcoin halving. We know that Bitcoin typically leads into the halving versus other altcoins. Bitcoin leads the beginning of cycles. Alts tend to get rotated into later when the market goes more risk on and gets euphoric. In the early stages, Bitcoin tends to outperform and Bitcoin dominance is in a clear uptrend until you see a clear reversal here. It's not altcoin season yet. It's not 
altcoin time to shine. Now it's really a Bitcoin market. Uh, for me, that's why I've kept myself relatively capitalized in Bitcoin. I think around the 50% mark, 40 to 50%. Um, and then, you know, the rest is Ethereum and alt, but it really depends on how risk on you, you want to go in this environment. If you've got enough discretionary income to continue averaging into altcoin positions and you're willing just to accept the loss in the short term and hold for next cycle, well, maybe you're in the boat where you just keep DCAing down into alts and eventually wait for that rotation. I don't think a lot of people are in that boat though. It would take balls of steel to execute a strategy like that. And although I follow that to an extent, I can't lie, I am keeping some significant exposure to Bitcoin because I still believe that it does lead into next cycle. And Ethereum, on the other hand, is looking quite weak. So if we look at ETH BTC, it's finally made its way into my blue box, which is my major support box for Ethereum BTC. Now, for the ETH bulls, you really want to see a reversal here, or things could definitely accelerate to the downside. Note we did get deviation below, so it's okay if ETH BTC drops below and then reclaims. That's fine. That's a that's normal market behavior. Uh, but if you do see a substantiated breakdown below this level, then I think the warning bells are starting to go off a little bit because your next target isn't till the 3.5 level. And at that point, uh, ETH BTC will already be down another 38%. That's going to send altcoin spiraling because ETH is the leader of the alt market. It's really important for Ethereum to perform well, for alts to perform well. And when ETH's bleeding, you best believe altcoins are going to bleed. So ETH BTC right now looking quite shaky. What you do want to see if to be a buyer of this uh, is a reversal here because we do have this slanting uh, trend line. What you want to wait for is a breakout of this trend and that will be confirmation to long into ETH BTC. You can actually make a support buy at this level. If you are a believer in Ethereum and you want to DCA in or maybe switch in Bitcoin out for ETH, I mean, now technically is a support buy of ETH BTC, but because it doesn't have momentum, I definitely wouldn't go all in until there's some sort of concrete reversal. You always want to wait for that confirmed pivot uh, before putting your major size in. When it comes to DCAing into positions, you can get an initial position in, maybe between 20 and 30%, but your major size, so that remaining 70 to 80% should be reserved for a confirmed reversal. That's what you're waiting for on ETH BTC. There will be some on-chain signs for altcoin specifically that you are getting a reversal. One way that I actually monitor this is on Kyber AI. So Kyber AI is essentially a tool that enables you to gauge momentum using their proprietary AI mechanism. So they have something called the Kyber score, which works out the momentum of an altcoin. So you'll be able to see whether based on the on-chain price action, an altcoin is shifting from bearish to bullish territory or bullish to bearish territory. I'll give you an example of a strategy that I actually use on Kyber AI. What I do when I'm trading majors, because we're talking here about, you know, an ETH reversal and a majors reversal is I go onto Kaiba AI, uh, which is at the top here. I go onto rankings, then I click all, then I filter by market cap of more than 500 million. Because unle unless I'm trying to like scalp smaller coins, typically for the bigger coins, I'll use uh, more than 500 million to filter and, you know, look at the major caps to try and find major reversals. Then what I'll do is I'll sort by Kyber score. And when we do see like, like an ETH BTC reversal, and I look to get into altcoin positions, um, I'll try and line this up with confluence for coins that have flipped from bearish into bullish territory and have held bullish territory. Because these are in four, four hour increments, I like to see a sample size over like a two to three day period that an altcoin has actually uh, started to exhibit bullish momentum. So then I would go into the coin, let's say take Arbitrum for, for example, it's currently neutral right now. Let's say it starts to uptick. Um, once I affirm that it uptick, I would go into on-chain analysis and then start looking at whether we are seeing significant buying starting to come in for the coin. And you can see here, they also have AI, uh, which amalgamates the buys and the sells to see whether there's more buyers or more on-chain sellers. You can also look at trading volume. So you want to look for that major spike in volume because a move, a reversal with no volume uh, isn't really a confirmed move. You do want to see buyers step in with size. So what I also look for is a volume uptick. I don't really like when there's not a volume uptick but there's a huge price pump. Typically, that indicates that it's futures volume coming in. So it's like speculation. So you also want to have a look at your CVDs on an application like Velo, which can tell you whether it's spot positioning or futures positioning. Of course, spot positioning is much better for sustainable pumps. Otherwise, you can end up getting wrecked um, on, on the futures because people get liquidated and then price tends to wick it and come back down. Also, net flow to whale wallets is another pretty cool metric because I'll sort by month here so you can see it more clearly. You can essentially 
see whether the whales are buying or whether the whales are selling. So if you see positive inflow, typically that means whales are starting to position themselves, so buying. If you see negative net flow, that generally means that whales are starting to sell. So this is also an indicator that I'll measure. So that helps you get confluence on like specific altcoins when ETH does reverse. Just thought I would share that strategy because I haven't talked about it much uh, on the show, but it's something that I actively do. I love monitoring the majors because yeah, sometimes on, on Kyber AI, uh, it can get a little bit distracting seeing all these like lower cap coins, although that's great for on-chain scalping strategies. It's not the best if you're looking to trade majors. And a lot of the time when the market first starts to reverse, I want to look at the majors before I start looking at the small caps, because why would I jump straight into small caps? I want to jump into the majors first. If you want to use Kyber AI, you can sign up to beta access using the link in the description. For crypto banter subscribers only, we are expediting the sign up process. So typically, you in some situations would have to wait weeks or months to get access to the platform. Uh, but for banter subscribers only, we are going to be speeding up the process to give you early access. So if you do want to use Kyber AI, I've been using it in my research all the time. You can click the link in the description and use it. It's completely free. So it's a completely free application that you can use to level up your crypto research and trading. Now, why is Ethereum dropping so much more than Bitcoin and why is Bitcoin dominance just rapidly rising? Well, on the ETH side of things, there are a lot of ETH specific headwinds right now. You have the foundation actively selling Ethereum, which is obviously not good. Um, I don't necessarily blame the foundation. Like obviously they need to sell some ETH to keep themselves running. They have a dev con coming up, etc. I don't blame them like others, but still it's not publicly a very good sign. The other factor is ETH is now technically inflationary because the activity has dried up in the crypto market. ETH has now ticked into uh, inflationary territory, despite it being deflationary for months. That's not great. That does put extra supply pressure on ETH. And speaking of supply pressure, we also had the hacker who has been selling off Ethereum that he hacked during the whole FTX liquidation thing. So there's a few reasons why Ethereum is not performing well. EIP also got delayed, which was the ETH's biggest catalyst. Um, so look, the ETH BTC trade is one that I took and then I got stopped out on. And now I'm essentially just waiting again to get back in. So anyone that uh, wants an update on that, that's essentially my position here. I'm not uh, entering any new ETH BTC position. And the, the last position I made was on the hope that we got a bounce on the one day chart. We didn't get a bounce. And that's exactly why he set stop losses, folks, because things just kept going down and down and down since then. So ETH BTC, that's pretty much where it sits. ETH certainly looking bearish versus Bitcoin. If you're a long-term accumulator of ETH, you probably like this relative weakness. If you're committed to DCAing all the way down, I think if you try and catch that falling knife, uh, you can get a lower cost basis because we accept we won't be able to always time the market. So with ETH, that's something I'm happy to just DCA into. In terms of the alts, a little bit harder to catch a falling knife just because uh, the price acceleration to the downside is usually much more drastic than you'll see on a token like Ethereum. By the way, the data ownership protocol testnet is coming very, very soon. And this is what I'm super excited about because it's an application that's going to allow you to essentially obfuscate your crypto assets to choose what you show to the public and what you don't show to the public. So you will essentially have your own choice over what you do with your data if you use the protocol. So you can essentially execute swaps and keep those swaps to yourself or hold assets in your wallet and keep those assets to yourself, but having it done in an immutable decentralized fashion on the blockchain. So super excited for that test net. And it's going to give you the ability to pick up some DOP tokens as they're giving away 1% of their DOP supply to early users of the product uh, who are going to be rewarded. So just keep your eye out for that over the coming days. I've had a chance to play around with it and it's really, really awesome. I can't wait uh, to run you guys through it on the show because I think it's an application that we need, especially with times like these when privacy is becoming more and more important in crypto. So there's a link in the description to DOP to check it out, but that test that's going to be available soon to enable you to get your hands on some tokens as well. And I hope you enjoyed today's show. Uh, if you found it interesting, let me know in the comments below. 